It's a great privilege to start off this week together, and I look forward to our times. As I said last night, we're going to be in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Um, two uh, brief notices. In Scotland, they don't kind of call them announcements, they're notices. So one notice is, uh, if you would like to chat any time this week with me, if I could be of any help, any input at all, I'd be happy to do that. I'm going to sit out amongst you at breakfast and lunch and just try to get to know you. Uh, so please avail yourself of that if that would be helpful. The other would be, as you come to breakfast, it would be wonderful if you could sit up close. It would be mu much nicer for me to actually see you close up, so maybe tomorrow some fill in here. That would be really, really great. This week in our chapel times, we'll be looking in key passages in Paul's letter to the Colossians. And as I said last night, each day I'm going to try to include a memory, a quote from Wilmus Chehi or Gladys, his wife, or especially my friend Dr. Shu, who so shaped me in my years here. And even today, we'll get started with that, in fact, right now. Here's a little bit of a look at Uncle Wilmus, as we called him, and Sam Shu, our illustrious piano faculty here. I was so moved by many things they said and in those years, and I continue to this day, I just carry around little cards and write down memorable statements or thoughts or events. And this one's from 1973. Here is the first from Uncle Wilmus. He took me on a little walk, put his arm around my shoulder, and he said, Give only your best to Jesus, Wesley. He is worthy of it. Wesley, give only your best to Jesus. He is worthy of it. The other notice I want to make as a dear myself to the faculty is that wherever we are at quarter of the hour, I'm going to stop. If it's mid-sentence, We'll catch it up the next day so that you can get to your lessons, your rehearsals, all that. So that's a promise to you. Keep me to that, and I'll do my very best. I have a lot to say from Colossians, but I'm just going to stop at quarter of the hour so that you can carry on. Give only your best to Jesus, Wes. He is worthy of it. This applies so well to our excursus through Colossians, as we will see shortly. And today, as I mentioned last night, my goal is actually to speak to the faculty, the counseling staff, the full staff here, who are here to educate you in all things musical and spiritual. Invite all of you students to more or less listen in to what I have to say to them. Sort of like when you go to a wedding and the sermon is for the bride and groom and you just get to listen in. That's what I'm inviting you to do today and maybe tomorrow, depending how far we go. Along a rather strange Colossian theme for this morning that I would phrase something like this, the slavery of even musical educators. The slavery of even musical educators. And I want to begin with a bit of a personal story. When I began my PhD studies at the University of Notre Dame, we had an introductory course, our first intro to PhD work, and we were to read 10 books, theological volumes, and write 10 short praises, which are kind of summaries, short, 10 short praises, one for each book. And I had done pretty well in college and then in graduate studies. And I kind of blew it off and I waited. I, I wrote all 10 of those in two weeks leading up to the course. So they were rather hurried. <laughs> And I got to the course, and we had the first day with Dr. Joseph Bleckensop was his name. Wasn't that a great name? Bleckensop. And after the first day of classes, full day, Dr. Bleckensop said, Wesley, I want you to stay. And he took me to his office, and he said as kindly as he could, 
If your work on those 10 presses is indicative of what you're going to do, then you should drop out right now because they're not up to standard for a PhD work. I was cut to the quick. I was stabbed in the heart by such a statement, and I knew he was right. I had fluffed it off. And that night I went home and I read this passage in Colossians. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And the Holy Spirit really showed me that I had not done it as unto the Lord, but for human purpose, and that is not at all pleasing to him. The next day I went to class, and afterwards I spoke with Dr. Bleckensop, and I basically repented, said, this is the passage that God spoke to me from. He was a wonderful true believer in a Catholic institution, Notre Dame, and he said, well, prove it to me over the next week. And I worked really, really hard and kept going. Colossians is particularly fitting, I think, particularly suited, that is, to the role of Christian educators in that one of its central concerns very likely was to respond to a type of smug academic idolatry that some scholars refer to rather humorously as the synchristic soup of religious philosophical ideas that were so rampant in Colossae in the New Testament era. The Apostle Paul's counteractive to this smug academic idolatry is to raise up Jesus Christ to the very heights of grandeur in what is arguably some of the highest Christology, that means the honoring, the worship, and particularly the study of Jesus Christ himself in all of the New Testament. I want to suggest, first of all, that this incredible letter to the Colossians has something very important to say to all of us educators about Christ and the enlightened mind. Not mind of enlightenment, but a enlightened mind given to Jesus. Christ and the enlightened mind. We find this emphasis in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Can you look at that right now, either on the screen or on your own Bible, put your finger in it, in which the apostle is concerned to remind us about giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he delivered us for the de from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. This is the only use of the term light in the entire Colossian letter, which in itself can be a clue to its interpretive significance. Sometimes prominence of an idea is alluded to in biblical writing by its very singularity. Only happens once in this letter, this term light. One of the ways that we can understand Paul's choice of resorting to this light-darkness contrast is in the common New Testament coupling of the relationship between light and life. Light that produces life. Light as a symbolic expression of what is eternally real, as contrasting with skotos or darkness speaking of error or simply unreality, all relating to what makes for meaningful living, life, or the lack of it. Light, in this sense, enables life by pointing both to what is real and to what is unreal as we perceive of it in our minds and in our behavior. It correlates 
to truth and untruth, as Graham mentioned last night. And it expunges the ridiculous notion that truth does not matter or that truth is personally and privately determined, or that it does not impinge upon public life. In scripture, that is a ridiculous notion. And I want to deliberately suggest, therefore, that this genuinely encourages us to explore our, how our work as teachers, especially perhaps music educators, can be and ought to be an expression of an exercise in light for life. Light that brings life. Our work faculty, counselor, staff is meant to enhance life in the same way that light is necessary for life through creative artistry and poetic expression and all of the beauty of the arts and technical proficiency and social understanding and emotional spiritual betterment, etc., etc. This kind of teaching, in other words, significantly, significantly contributes to a more Christianly holistic living by rigorously advocating for what is eternally real and eternally meaningful as opposed to acquiescing to what merely makes for survival. Scripture wants light to bring real life. And good teachers in all fields, but especially in artistic expressions, that's your goal, to bring light to students for the purpose of meaningful living and eternal living. And in this, Paul unhesitatingly points to Christ himself as the apex of it all. The Colossian context bears this out as later in chapter 1, the apostle again puts this in an ardently Christ-focused Christological affirmation, suggesting, as you see there in verse chapter 1, verse 28, you see it with me there, look at it in your Bible, that our goal is nothing less than admonishing every person and teaching every person en passe Sophia with all wisdom, so that we may present every human being, teleon and Christo, complete in Christ. David Ford, who I've had the privilege to co-teach with at Cambridge University, describes such an approach to the biblical ideal of integrated life as what he says, faith in the optative mode evoked by the divine call of God and the insatiable desire to know, to learn, to experience, to be adventurous in the quest for understanding more about this world that God has created. It searches the heights and depths of our fragile existence, says David Ford, always learning and discerning, never past being surprised. It is a faith whose source, hope, and delight is the God of blessing who loves in all wisdom. Dear music teachers, music educators, staff and counselors who all contribute to this learning process, teach your students this week in that divine optative mode that does not hesitate to affirm that Christ is the apex of it all that every person, teaching every person with all 
wisdom so that we may present every human being complete in Christ. We naturally then come to a second suggestion in terms of this Pauline letter to the Colossians, noting something very important that it has to say to us with regard not only to Christ and the enlightened mind, but now Christ and the enslaved mind. We must, however, admit the shock value attached to this radical idea, for it is presented to us in those verses that I referenced at the beginning as they portrayed my own story in academia, chapter 3, verses 23 to 24 again. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And what is obviously bothersome about this otherwise helpful admonition is that it comes in the context of what's called Paul's Haustfallen Perikabi, household teaching order. And in this section, it is dealing with the relationship between masters and slaves. We see that clearly when we back up in our reading to verse 22. The context, slaves, in all things obey your masters, that is, masters according to the flesh, fearing the Lord. However, given the reference to slavery here, what should be noteworthy to you and me faculty, counselor, staff, is that it unquestionably includes us. Marcus Bart offers what most consider to be the quite conclusive summary in a 103-page introduction to the social background of slavery in the time of Paul's writing. Bart demonstrates how there were, to be sure, very privileged domestic slaves who were highly paid in high-level administrative posts, but were slaves nonetheless, and very low slaves who, by the nature of the abusive work they were given, were practically exposed to slow and painful death. But the vast majority of slaves were clearly the middle slave class, slave middle class, who basically had steady and sure employment, many in such positions voluntarily, and it included skilled craftsmen, craftswomen, artisans of all sorts, those in various fine arts, those in medical arts, and educators, teachers, who were employed by the estates of the rich to teach their whole household, educators. And it is with that in mind that we read these, again, Christologically situated words here. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And as we conclude, I want to suggest then that that raises two questions for those of us who might consider our vocation to be something related to educational goals. Who do you serve? And how do you serve? In terms of the who, the text from Colossians compels us to consider all of this rightly in relation to Jesus Christ, the apex of it all. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for people. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Perhaps some of us, as part of the educational, educative system are here this morning, this summer, and we've lost that sense of calling, an approach to musical education that is truly vocational, a divine optative call from God. 
But I want to blatantly, as blatantly as possible, remind you of this biblical injunction for those of us who care about holistic teaching. That who you serve, your awareness of who you really serve, is hugely important. Today, teachers, counselors, in various ways that you enter the teaching educative process, are you serving the Lord Christ? And now just some brief concluding comments about the question of how you serve. These same verses from the Colossian text tell us, don't they? For one, we should not overlook the verb in the phrase, to curio Christu dulu ete, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve, dulu ete. It is in the mode of a servant is the how. And many religious type folk have a high and noble ideal of servanthood until they actually are in the position of serving. It is not easy. It is humbling. You deal with lots of failure. And it does not square easily with many academically oriented and musically oriented egos. Do you conceive of your teaching role in terms of a being a servant? Our job this week is to serve you. And what a joy for me to say, that's part of my role. I'm here just to serve. Secondly, the phrase, do your work heartily, back in verse 23, is quite loaded with content, isn't it? Do your work heartily. What the text translates as heartily is literally. Get this, this is so interesting, cool, and important. <laughs> literally, ex tsukes. Tsukes means soul. Do your work from the soul, is what the Apostle Paul is driving at. Heartily means soulful teaching in our situation. This calls for what Jeremy Begbie, music educators, if you haven't read Jeremy Begbie, Begbie you should start after this week. <laughs> he refers to as soul-based capacities. And in the Greek culture of the New Testament writers, this soul-based capacities included in summary fashion, as Jeremy Begbie puts it so well, the capacity for imagination, the capacity for passion, and the capacity for love. One of the things I love about Chehi and all these years I've been coming is I see those three, three capacities played out every day imagination, passion, love of Christ, love of God, love of each other, leads me to a logical conclusion that allows me to share a statement from my dear mentor, brother, colleague, Sam Shu, that has lingered with me over many years and I wrote it down in one of my cards dated 1975. One night after a Chehi concert under the stars, under the stars in Muncie, Pennsylvania, Sam bought me a milkshake at the snack bar as we were reliving the highs and lows of the concert we had just participated in. This is what Sam said to me in the best musical moments, the soul is freed to sing. In the best musical moments, the soul 
is freed to sing. Students, are you listening in when I adjure your teachers, your counselors, your staff to approach the art of music as a soul-based capacity? Teach your students with such a pedagogy that their inner soul is set free to sing to the Creator God. Give them the capacity to join in the Christ hymn, which we will look at tomorrow morning in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Thank you, Jesus, for this incredible letter to the Colossians. Thank you for the amazing faculty, counselors, staff who live this out in so many ways. I pray that you'd empower them to serve today, empower me to serve. Thank you for these amazing students. And we want to give them the capacity for imagination, capacity for passion, and the capacity for love. In the name of Jesus.